This enablement training for Hybrid Workspaces Application Streaming Server is part two of two, covering troubleshooting. This course will cover Hybrid Workspaces Application Streaming Server, part two, troubleshooting the server and troubleshooting applications. Feel free to download any course PDFs to follow along or reference. Be sure to watch part one of this series for install and configuration of the system. The presenter is Turbo Developer and Engineer Oleg Sofane. This presentation is presented to a live audience, so there will be discussions and questions throughout the presentation. Let's begin. Today, we will be going over troubleshooting Turbo Server. So we'll go over a few basics as well as uh, what you can do when you encounter an issue. First, server has four launch modes right now. There's running cloud, HTML5, in which case the, the application will execute on an application server, and then it will stream to your device inside the web browser. This does require a Turbo client, and it supports any HTML5 browser. There is run in cloud windowed. So again, the application will execute on an application server and it will stream to your device using the TurboNet native client. We currently have a native client for Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. Sorry, Oleg, just really quick back on HTML5. Any, uh, you guys see any issues with Chromebooks lately? No, I don't have any reported issues for Chromebooks. Okay, just curious if there's been any changes or if that still works as expected. That should still work as expected. Uh, again, this mode supports any HTML5 browser. So it could also be Linux machines using Chrome or Firefox. Raspberry Pi, I've tested it. Works great. <laughs> yeah. There are local launches. So if run on my PC, we'll actually get the application SVM file downloaded and cached to your local device. It will be executed there. This supports Windows systems right now, and it requires the Turbo Client for Windows. And finally, there's the install on my PC. Using this launch mode, we'll put the application's shortcuts to your desktop and start menu as well as register any file extensions and protocols. It supports Windows only and requires a Turbo client. Accessing files. So if you are running locally, access to files is pretty direct, assuming you have used Turbo products previously. Access to files will depend on isolation settings. However, if you are running in the cloud. Remember, this application is running on the application server. So the access to the files via isolation is on that application server, not on the local machine. So the end users have to be trained on how to save files so they can get access to them. Now, if the customer is an experienced Citrix shop, they know how to deal with that. If they are new, the end users might be a little confused. The primary way that we deal with file access today is using the T drive. In this case, you'll hook up a cloud storage provider to your Turbo server or an SMB file share. And the user will be able to access the files using the T drive or a specified location for where you've configured the cloud storage to be mounted. Question, if the T drive is already being used by a different mapping, will it overwrite? I believe if the T drive is being used by another mapping, it will not be mounted. So if you have a conflict, you will want to configure the T drive to be mounted as a separate path under the T drive if you want to reuse that drive letter or a different drive letter. Just to give you an idea,
you go to oh that's the wrong one if you go to the server administration portal under integrations if you click on your cloud storage provider you can actually say where you want where you want the storage to be mounted to all right now well one question you said something about smb it, does the mapping occur from the server or from your pc it, it depends it's mapped via the portal okay so the file share must be accessible to the portal okay N now Along those lines, you, you said SMB, but we do have some old, you know, basically netware shops. If the portal had the OES client on it, could it potentially map to an NCP share? That has not been tested. It will okay. have to be double checked. Okay. Yeah, the concept would be putting the Novell client on the portal server, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. So that it can access the path. Because the portal basically manages the storage. The user does not have direct access to the files themselves. Everything will go to the T drive, which is uh, connected via the portal. Just to emphasize, that's, that's also for people that work from home that they do not even are able, they're, they're not even able to get to SMB shares. But as soon as the, as long as the portal is there and got the access, then yes, you can correct. Get, get access through that. So that's yep. the benefit. Mm -hmm. So the Turbo client, whether it's on the local PC or on the application server, will route the files through the portal. Okay. And I believe it should work as long as the portal can write to the path and it behaves like a typical folder because you can actually do local non-SMB uh, paths in the portal itself. Okay. Uh, moving on. Unless anyone has uh, other questions. So the Turbo server will automatically install the WinFSP driver on the application servers to handle the running cloud launch modes. If you want access to the T drive for local launches, then you need to install this WinFSP driver manually on the client machines. And this is for the local run on my PC and install on my PC modes. Now, another nice thing, if you are using the cloud storage integration, you can also view, download, upload, and open files using the Files tab on the portal. You can configure the file associations using the Workspace Administration Portal under General File Associations. So if I were to hook up this XLS X file extension with Microsoft Excel, I can actually left click on it and it will run using the default launch mode. So that can be run in cloud or run on my PC with the Excel application. Access to files for, so this is for isolation. You can enable access to user profile folders under the workspace application settings. And that will be in the isolation setting. This is typically enabled by default, and it will give users access to the desktop, documents, downloads, pictures, etc. folders on the user's profile. It's important to note that when you use the run in cloud launch mode, this will give access to the user's profile folder on the application server. Some enterprises that is okay because they map the user folders to a network share or they mount them using some other solution like FS logics. Mount points. Uh, this is also configured in the workspace application settings. It will be under the storage section and it mounts the specified native folder from the host to the specified target path in the container. So it's another way to poke a hole in the isolation if you want to get access to uh, native files. This is more of a legacy transfer files. If you're using the 
running cloud HTML5 interface, you can click on the folder at the bottom menu and you can transfer files between the user folders and your local PC. So it applies only to running cloud HTML5 and it also requires that access to local user folders is enabled. Most customers right now have transitioned away from this method and are using the cloud storage integrations because it's much more uniform and it can apply to all of the launch modes, either local execution or cloud execution. And it's also easier for end users. Map drives. If you are using the run in cloud windowed option, you will see in the save dialogs, you will have the drive letter on your local machine name. And you can use that to access your local files and folders. This is also accessible using the TS client slash drive path. For this to work, you need to enable the driver direction setting. Again, customers have generally moved away from this method in favor of the cloud storage integration. You can also have network drives. This is configured in the admin portal under the general page in the streaming section. And what it does is it basically maps the network path for any of the running cloud launch modes. This gives you direct access to the file share. So it doesn't use the T drive, but it only applies to the running cloud launch mode. The network drive will not be mounted if the path is invalid or inaccessible to the remote user, or the drive letter conflicts with an existing local or network drive. And this is used as an alternative to configuring a drive maps in the GPO for the application servers. So if you hit an issue, the first thing you want to do would be to collect diagnostic logs and other diagnostic traces so you can troubleshoot the problem. For the running cloud HTML5 launch mode, if there is a server problem, there should be a detailed error message displayed to the user. It should also be a link to our online documentation on the encountered issue. And the link is provided below. You receive a copy of the slides so you can reference this. When using the running cloud HTML launch mode, there will also be additional log traces in the browser console. You should check these logs if you encounter an unexpected session close message with no error details. It can also be used to track the state of the container launching on the application server, as well as identify container launch errors because it will indicate the exit code for the application. The run on my PC and running cloud windows will generate client side uh, logs on the local machine and can be collected from the local application data turbo logs folder. These traces should be analyzed together with the respective traces from the server logs. And you can use the timestamps and user IDs to match the client logs to the server logs. Collect the server logs you will do that from the server administration portal under domain servers, uh, the server name, and then the diagnostics section. To generate a log archive, click on the archive button. And this will basically compress all of the Turbo server logs into a single zip file that you can download using the link. In this case, the logs will also be cleaned up from the server's file system. So they'll only be a part of the zip archive. Another thing to note is that every time you restart the Turbo server service, it will generate a server log archive, which will compress the existing logs into a zip archive and clean them up from the file system. 
And this is important to note because if you are restarting the service or the server as part of your troubleshooting, you should collect those log archives to analyze for errors. In addition, you should be collecting a server log archive from each server in a farm to get a complete picture of the issue. So that means that if you have a hub, a portal, and two application servers, you should be collecting log archives from all four of those servers. And to give you an idea of how this works, uh, here I have my Turbo server. I'll go ahead and click on Domain. And then servers, I'll click on my server name. I only have one server in this example. If you have multiple servers, they will show up here. And then I'll click on the diagnostics section, scroll down and hit the archive button. So go ahead and uh, collect all of the logs and put them in a zip file that I can now download. And then I can analyze the logs in here for issues. OK. If the admin portal is not accessible to the server administrator, you can manually collect the logs from their paths. The main logs will be in the Turbo server installation folder under the logs subfolder. By default, this is C program files, x86, turbo server slash logs. For microfocus, this will use the microfocus folder. The turbo client logs for the server and the Apache proxy server logs will be under the C program data, turbo slash logs. I believe microfocus also uses a custom branding folder for this path. Turbo client user logs folder will be under the C users, username, app data, local turbo logs folder. This will use the standard turbo folder. The trace level is set in the C program data turbo server settings file. Generally, in the past, you have had to set this to debug. Today, this is defaulted to debug, and I would generally not recommend lowering the trace level because it will make it harder to support the customer in the event that an issue occurs. Changing the trace level will require that you restart the Turbo Server service. So in addition to the Turbo server logs. It is also useful to look at the event viewer for events that may be contributing to the problem. Generally, you would look for events that are logged around the same time that the issue occurs. And these events can be logged for both server and application issues. For example, they can be GPO policies that prevent the user from using the run in cloud, Windows, or HTML5 launch modes. There could be a domain configuration problem that prevents Kerberos authentication from working. There could be crashes in the application itself, or hardware problems such as running out of resources that is causing slow performance or hardware errors such as the disk going bad. The diagnostic page also has an option to reboot the server, which will restart the system. This is useful if the system is being unresponsive and the Turbo Server Administrator does not have direct access to the machine. One of the things that you have to do Determine whether when an issue occurs, whether it's related to Turbo Server or your packaged application. One thing you can do is run the application on the application server using the command line. For example, Turbo Try and then the application image. If 
this doesn't work, it tells you that the problem appears to be in the application package itself because the application package doesn't start and it doesn't have to do with Turbo Server. If it's an application or application configuration issue, you have to proceed with gathering VM logs and troubleshooting the application itself. We've previously covered this under the Turbo Debugger training session. You can also run an application that is known to work. For example, you can go to the admin portal and import the Notepad++ application from TurboNet Hub and then run that from the portal. If this application does not work, it is probably a server issue somewhere. You can also try launching the application using a different mode. For example, if the application works using running cloud HTML5, but not running cloud windowed, it, it will appear to be a server problem somewhere. It could be a server bug or some network or security configuration that prevents the application from working correctly in window mode. If the application works using running cloud, but not run on my PC, then it's likely an application issue. For example, the application server does not have access to a licensing server when running on the local PC. In this case, what you'd want to do is open communication channel to the licensing server using the network tunneling option. Now, if the application works using run on my PC, but not run in cloud, uh, this could be either an application or a server issue. For example, the local PC could have a runtime that the application server does not. Or alternatively, the application server might have our security setting enabled or RDS calls are not set up that block the application from running in cloud. Generally, when you use the running cloud HTML5 launch mode, application sessions will close unexpectedly with a session close message when there's a problem with the application or application configuration. In this case, the browser console logs will have events logged that show that the container session is starting, running, and then wow. uh, it stopped and exited. Oh, wow. And this could be, for example, that the application failed to start because it's missing a file. Generally, when this happens in the console logs, you'll see that it indicates server error 10108, which is the code for the disconnect was initiated by the user. If it's a server issue, you'll typically see this error message with detailed information as well as a link to the problem. Additionally, if you open the browser console logs, you may see that you get the same error message saying that the disconnect was issued by the user. If you're using running cloud windowed, application issues typically, again, show as disconnect reason remote by user. And again, these logs will be located uh, in the Turbo Logs folder on the local machine. If it's a server problem, then you'll see other reasons or reasons other than disconnect reason remote by user. For example, here we have disconnect reason at client WinSock FD close. And these areas can generally be Googled to find more information. If you're running the application locally, which is run on my PC or install on my PC, if you inspect the logs, you'll see that the application launched trace over here, and then the application exited with an error code. And if you see that, it will indicate that it's probable application problem, not a server problem. If you see some other error, such as could not find the device key for subscription, then it's a problem between the server and the client. 
and it will typically be accompanied by a UI pop-up for the error. So if you hit a server problem, you should collect and analyze the Turbo Server and Turbo Client logs. Additionally, you should collect the applicable event logs and then consult the online documentation. If you hit an application issue, you should collect and analyze VM diagnostic logs. Additionally, you should collect event logs for the application issue if they are being generated. In the event of a crash or a hang, you should collect a memory dump. And then you can consult our online documentation on troubleshooting and using the Turbo Studio debugger. I'll also be sending uh, application troubleshooting slides. I believe that there's also a video uh, on the Studio debugger as well. Moving on to some issues that we've seen. There could be unexpected failures or unexpected behavior due to GPO settings that are common in enterprise environments. You should check the GPO policies and ensure that they're not configured or use the recommended settings from the Turbo Server documentation. And we have a link to the documentation here. If you are unable to access the portal or admin sites by entering the URL in the browser, you should check that the Turbo Service service is running. The service may sometimes fail to start on really slow machines due to a timeout in the Windows Service Control Manager. I typically see this only on very slow machines that are either not meeting the requirements outlined in our documentation or on VMs that are having noisy neighbor problem. And a noisy neighbor basically means that the hypervisor is running multiple VMs and other VMs from the hypervisor are hogging the resources and are making the server VM very, very slow and unable to respond in a timely manner. In some other cases, the service could have been manually stopped. To resolve this issue, you should check whether it's running and start it. From the command line, you can execute SC query turbo to check the status and SC start turbo to start it. For microfocus, the service will be called MFDC instead. You can also start it from the services management console. An alternate possibility is that the server service user does not have access to the database. For this, you will need to check the Turbo server service logs for errors regarding permissions to the database or failure to log into the database. And to resolve it, you need to configure the SQL server to grant access to the service user and then restart the Turbo service service. It's also possible that you have a problem with your SSL configuration. In this case, you will need to check the Turbo server logs for SSL certificate problems. It could also be a problem with your firewall configuration. In this case, you check the Turbo server and Turbo client logs for network errors. Another problem that you can hit is that the Turbo Hub and Broker reach their memory limit. In this case, you can see that pages or sections fail to load with an internal server error 500. To identify the problem, you check the Turbo server logs for memory errors. If you notice memory errors, you should increase the available memory for the processes in the admin portal, domain servers under the server name, and then Java virtual machine settings. For the hub, you would increase the hub heap max. And for the broker, you would increase the broker heap max. You can also set this using the command line interface. Another issue that we sometimes see is when users are unable to push their application to their server. The primary problem here is that the server is not logged into the server as a server administrator. To resolve the issue, you want to point the client to your server and log in as an administrator user. 
if you want to add users to be server administrators, you'd go to the administrator portal under users and then users and groups and open up the server administrators group over here and add the users to it that you want to administer your Turbo server. After you do that, the server will quickly refresh itself and should be back up and running within a couple of minutes. If that doesn't resolve the problem, you need to check the client logs on the end user's device for more information. It's possible that a network problem prevents the user from pushing the application image to the hub. You should also check that all server services are running. If the hub is down, you won't be able to push uh, to your Turbo server. If you hit an SSL error, you should verify your SSL configuration to make sure that you don't have an expired or invalid certificate. Improper firewall configuration will block access to the portal, administrator portal, as well as launching applications. You should ensure that the required ports for communication between server and the end user, as well as between server roles, are open. And the required ports between server and client are listed under the required externally as yes. For between server and server communication, the ports are listed as no under required externally. Generally, the Turbo Server Installer will configure these ports in the Windows firewall. However, these can be overridden by group policies or won't apply if the customer is using a third-party firewall. Additionally, if the Turbo Server service is installed without administrative privileges, it won't be able to configure the firewall settings. An improper SSL certificate configuration will also cause failure to load pages. It can also cause you to fail to sign in, as well as push or run applications. You should check the server and client logs for SSL errors. Here are some examples of traces that contain such errors. As you can see, uh, when an error occurs that's related to this, you'll usually see key terms such as SSL, certificate, PAM, or PKIX. You should check that your certificate is not expired and it's valid for the specified URLs that are being in use. You can also use a third-party tool such as SSL Labs to test your portal certificate. If your certificate is part of a chain, you need to ensure that the intermediate chain certificate is specified in the Turbo Server configuration. If it's a self-signed certificate, you have to make sure it's added to the Windows Certificate Store on all of your server and client systems so it will be trusted. Additionally, you should make sure that the key and certificate files are not encrypted because Apache cannot read encrypted certificate files. And additional troubleshooting information is provided at the link below. RDS licensing is required on servers with the application role. This excludes Windows 10 and 11 multi-user instances on Azure. These instances use a different RDS mechanism that doesn't require licensing. It doesn't require licensing for cows. It still requires to be licensed by Microsoft. When RDS is not configured, you'll see a notice at the bottom right of the screen when you try to RDP to the application server. It will give you information on how many days are left in your grace period. When the grace period expires, running cloud launches will fail. Local executions that don't occur on application server will continue to work because local launches don't require RDS calls. The failure will be shown in the HTML5 launch mode as the service is not licensed. Running cloud windowed will show that the license negotiation failed. 
can also show that remote desktop license services are not available to provide a license. If something like this occurs, you have to connect to the affected application server by using a remote desktop session for administering the server. And then you can use this administrative RDP session to configure the RDS licensing per Microsoft documentation. Sometimes when the application server is installing Windows updates, if users try to use the running cloud launch option, they will see a message that the service is not available because the RDS service may be restarting. Generally, the HTML5 launch mode fails with unknown error 1502. The running cloud windowed launch mode will show the connecting dialog, but then the application will never appear after the dialog disappears. If you attempt to RDP to the application server, it will fail without an error. In this case, your option is to wait for the application server to finish the Windows update process. You should also consider disabling Windows updates or configuring Windows updates to update at a specified maintenance interval when people are not using the service, generally during nighttime. In some cases, the RDS service may bug out and become unresponsive due to Windows bugs. The symptoms will be similar to when Windows is installing updates. However, Windows updates are not currently being installed in the system. The workaround for this case is to restart the remote desktop service or the application server system to recover the server. Moving on to storage provider issues. If you have improperly configured the storage provider integration settings, you will commonly encounter issues where you're unable to connect to a storage provider integration in the files tab. The storage provider folder or files will not appear on the T drive, and you're likely to see storage provider error messages when launching applications. In this case, you'd go to the admin general integration storage providers and then pick the storage provider that is having the issue, then click the test button. If there are no errors found, the test will show a success page. However, if users are unable to access the files, you will likely see a problem here, such as an expired access token or expired secret. Here is an example. If the test succeed, but the user is still unable to access their files, have them disconnect their storage service and then reconnect it. In the past, this token used to expire if the user hasn't run an application in a long time. However, today, in the most recent version, we put in an update that it automatically tries to refresh the tokens so they don't expire. Sometimes the user can see an error message saying that the application is not configured as a multi-tenant application. If this is the case, the user is trying to log in with their external OneDrive account, which requires a multi-tenant app registration. In this case, you must ensure that the user is trying to log in with their OneDrive account connected with the organization, or you have set up the application registration as a multi-tenant. When the user is prompted to grant permission, they're warned about the domain being unverified. The following document explains how to resolve the unverified message. If they try to log in and they get the reply URL specified does not match the configured reply URLs, uh, you have to ensure that the redirect URL for your server is added to the application registration. If the user sees the need admin approval message, you can follow the following steps at the link below to grant administrative consent for the OneDrive application registration for the entire tenant. Alternatively, you can have each user agree to consent. 
If you continue getting errors and are unable to resolve the problem using the troubleshooting steps, you should check for errors in the Turbo client logs. These logs, if you're using a local launch, will be on the local system. If you're using a cloud launch, they will be on the application server. Similarly, if you have not configured single sign-on, it will prevent users from logging into the portal. To troubleshoot this issue, you should be inspecting the hub logs for login failures. Here's some examples for when you have issues with SAML 2.0, as well as OpenID with Azure AD. To resolve the errors, you need to follow the configuration instructions in the documentation. If you encounter an issue with upgrading the Turbo server, you should ensure that you run the Turbo server installer for the new version on all systems in your farm. The hub server must be updated first and then the rest of the servers. It doesn't matter the order of the portal or application servers. They can be all done at the same time. And the important part here is that the hub is the first one. The server service has to be shut down and started back up after the upgrade is completed. This happens automatically by the Turbo Server installer. So you should plan a maintenance period to upgrade your Turbo Server farm. You can post a notification to your users from the administration portal. The Windows user account running the Turbo Server installer to upgrade must have administrative privileges to the system so that they can update the files for the server. And they also need to have access to the database in order to upgrade it, or the upgrade process will fail. Uh, documentation for upgrading Turbo Server is available at the link here. And finally, complete online documentation for anything server related is available on our site at the following link. Any questions? I guess I have one that might pertain to some of us uh, in support in uh, people in the field. When we install out of box, we have a 60 day eval, um, okay. which means RDS is installed and the whole bit. After that 60 days, we may use this only occasionally when we're in front of customers. And so that 60 days may run out. Do you recommend just installing RDS or is there a way to reset that 60 day license? Are you talking about the Turbo Server license or the RDS? The RDS. Cows license? The RDS calls? Yeah. <laughs> Um, that's, that's 120 days, but you'll need to Microsoft license for that. So as far as I know, you cannot. Cannot extend that? Okay. Change that. I don't uh, know. So oh, generally, generally, I spin up a VM when I do customer demos. So I always start at 120 day grace period. I basically keep a VM where it's before RDS has been installed. And then when I install Turbo Server, it configures RDS and starts the trial. And then I show or demo to the customer. <laughs> so it sort of depends on the customer and what their software assurance plan allows them to do as well as their licensing person tells them is okay. Any other questions from the gallery? Not hearing any. Thank you very much, Oleg. Appreciate your time. Yep. You guys have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.